Welcome to the 1960s Project. The 1960s Project brings you voices from the 1960s. In the 1960s Project, we'll, we've been recalling, remembering, and reflecting on, event, you know, on events that have influenced our lives. My name is Jerome Page, and we're in season two, week seven. And we're holding our fourth and final conversation across generations for the month of February. My guest today in crafting his message to younger generation talks about four M's, Malcolm, Muhammad Ali, Martin Luther King Jr. and Motown. Before we discuss these four M's with my guests, I have four ask. I ask you to like and follow us on Facebook. I ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I ask you to read and comment on our blogs. And more importantly, I ask you to share our shows, videos, and blogs with your friends and colleagues. As I mentioned in previous shows, there's a rule of thumb that generational trauma can exist for at least five generations. What that means if we start today, we can create a new script for our family and others to break the effect of trauma we're experiencing, we are experiencing today. We can break the curse. We, we can also create new habits. For me, I know three of my four grandparents, both my parents, my siblings and myself, my daughter, my grandnieces and nephews. So five generations is well within my grasp. So I have firsthand knowledge of five generations. Through the work of one of my sisters, I can extend my knowledge to nine generations. One way to turn things around is to pass on the lessons we've learned in our generation. That's what we're doing in this show. We're holding a conversation across generations. Tony Browder will be sharing life lessons he learned growing up in what he calls the United States of Con Contradictions. We'll ask him what that means, the United States of Contradictions. Through our conversation, we'll learn about Tony and these contradictions. Uh, Tony, uh, welcome. Tony, are you there? Okay, I see Okella has joined us. I don't see my, okay, it's Okella, you, we're waiting for Tony to join us and we'll see for those who've had a chance to look at Tony's blog or read his Tony, Tony his blog, he shares quite a bit of information about uh, his life growing up in the 1960s. So let me check my phone here. Okay. Somebody says, I need to bring up Tony. Let me see how to do that. Do -do -do -do. Okay. <laughs> Give me a second here. I don't see the command for bringing Tony up. Uh, just do a few glitches here. Mm -hmm. Do this. Oh, okay. Let me try this here. Bear with me, folks. Nope. 
that's not it. Okay, we have a little glitch here. Let me pause a second and check in with um, producer Ty. Can you text me? Okay. Well, maybe we can ask Tony to log out and come back in.
We're coming back on. We're having a little technical dif difficulty bringing up the guests, but I see that Okella is here. You have any questions for me, Okella and Amy Elias? I liked your comments you had on Facebook, Amy. Appreciate that very much. I like that Boys to Men music you provided the link to. Do you have a favorite Boys to Men tune? You can type it in the chat box. Um, as mentioned, we the 1960s project has been we've been broadcasting the show since September 8th. And we've been having, we had two seasons. The first season, the reflections were on uh, being in high school in the 1960s. Since the first of the year, we've been expanding our voices, uh, expanding the concept of voices from the 1960s. And for the month of February, we've been holding conversations across generations. Uh, for our first show in February, we had Lewis Hicks, who wrote a letter to his great grandnephew. Uh, Lewis uh, was in high school in the 1960s, and he was sharing his career progression and his academic correct progression and providing his advice for his nephew on the importance of education, the importance of savings, the importance of planning, and how this can lead to him when he's ready to retire uh, many years from now, that he would be in a position to continue to do what he liked and loved. The importance of education is a theme that has run across all our shows so far. Uh, then in the second week, we had a show with um, uh, Brian, Brian McCullough. And Brian McCullough was a child of the 1960s. His parents were in the 1960s. His father and I graduated in the class of 1965, different, different, different locations. I've graduated in from Philadelphia, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And Brian graduated in, uh, his father graduated in, in South Carolina. And his mother graduated in 1964. So uh, Brian's uh, talk across generations was sharing what lessons he learned from his father and from his mother. Um, and then well, the, the importance of hard work, uh, the importance of getting a good education, uh, the importance of sharing family traditions, the importance of, of um, building community. And currently, Brian is working on, I think, his second doctorate degree. He currently has a doctorate degree in, or at least a master's degree in theology. He's currently working over at the Wesleyan Theological Seminary over on Massachusetts Avenue in Northwest DC. Um, so they, these were the kinds of lessons. Uh, those were lessons from somebody who was, was born in the 1960s, getting from his parents or maybe he had not in his parent, not not he being born in the 1960s, but his parents being uh, coming of age in the 1960s, and the lessons he learned from them. These, so these were these were the themes uh, that we've had so far um, with the uh, voices across generations. And we also had Okella Trice sharing lessons that she was sharing with her grand with her uh, her grandchild her granddaughter and the importance of family and in the show with uh, Okella Trice she Okella Trice is my oldest sister and she shared her genealogical research uh, back to uh, 1792 where she discovered Shadrach Palmer uh, Shadrach Palmer was enslaved at that time, but my sister Okella, and that's what takes us back nine generations, my sister Okella was able to find his manumission papers. And not only did Shadrach purchase his freedom, he in turn purchased the freedom of his wife. So this is important um, 
a story in our family history, uh, Shadrach Palmer would be on my grandmother's mother's line of the family. And so we're able to go back nine generations, uh, picking up a story that that uh, starts with in, in, in being enslaved and one that picks up with uh, someone who's enslaved being able to earn enough money doing work off the plantation to purchase his freedom and the freedom of his wife. So the, the traditions of, of building businesses, of getting education runs very deep in the family lore and traditions in the Palmer Page line of our family. Pages would be my paternal side and the Palmers would be our, our, our mother's side. So I'm gonna pause again and go off camera and see where we are in terms of correcting our technical difficulty. Oops. And I assume I'm in. Okay. All right. So we're back. Hey, Tony. Hey, Jerome. How are you? Long time no see. <laughs> good, good. Well, we're going to talk about the four M's, right? Uh, Malcolm. We're going to talk about Martin, Muhammad Ali, and Motown. But before we begin, uh, let me I let me start with the question. Uh, you can you obviously included it in your some form in your blog, but but how old are you, Tony? I will be seventy years old on July the twenty sixth. Okay, happy early birthday to you. Thank you. Um, so that's when you'll be. Wow, that's a big one for you, huh? It is. It is. I'm actually planning to uh, go skydiving on my birthday. Okay, I and I've always wanted to do, and um, that's going to be my birthday present to myself. Okay, well, Gina, I have to give you some tips on that. I think she did that once for herself. Okay, cool. All cool. right, so Gina being, we know who Gina is, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> well, how many generations are you aware of in your family? I, I can go back, uh, as far as I can go back is my great-grandmother on my maternal side. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew her. And that's that's about it. I know stories of of um, my grandfather's um, parents. I believe his mother 
was his mother was uh, part Cherokee and part German, if I'm not mistaken, of the story. Uh, if I can remember the story, yeah. Okay, oh. and, and and where where did what what city did you go to high school? For? Well, I went to high school um, freshman year in high school was in Chicago on the west side of Chicago, and then my mother and I moved from Chicago to Oak Park, uh, which is a western suburb. Oak Park is to Chicago as Silver Spring is to the District of Columbia, right okay. across the border. Okay, and did your family always live in Chicago? Yeah, my family migrated to Chicago from Vernon, Alabama um, in the late 1930s. I think my mother was about five years old when uh, the family moved uh, from Vernon, Alabama, a very small town in Western Alabama, about 20 miles from the Mississippi border, from Columbia, Mississippi. Okay, I was gonna ask you to give me some geographical pointers for where Vernon, Vernon, Alabama was because I hadn't heard of that before. Mm -hmm. So is that considered like really rural or deep rural? Uh, it is. I, I went down there about five years ago to visit the family and it's country. It's sure enough country. Even, <laughs> even in the 21st century, it's still country. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so your family was part of the Great Migration, do you think? Family's part of the Great Migration. Um, my grandparents moved to Chicago. My grandmother's mother moved to Mount Clemens, Michigan, which is a suburb of Detroit. And my grandfather's siblings moved to Philadelphia. Okay, so my family moved from Virginia around uh, up to Philadelphia, from down in the Tidewater area of Virginia up to Philadelphia. So mm -hmm. following that path north. Absolutely. Uh, so Tony, you, you, in your blog, you said you were coming of age in the United States of contradictions. What, sure. What, what, what was that age like? Why, how did you come to use this concept of the United, uh, in, uh, age in the, uh, coming of age in the United States of contradictions? Well, uh, uh, and so I came of age in the 60s and um, having been born in 51, Okay. And uh, the 60s to me were the most vibrant decade in, in, the, in the 20th century. So many things were set in motion in the 60s that we're still reaping the benefits of. And um, so 60s, we were in the middle of the civil rights movement. I grew up with um, having uh, seen King March in Chicago. I grew up uh, seeing the Black Panther um, party marching in Chicago. I went to college with uh, a young lady who was actually in the house the night Fred Hampton was murdered. Uh, I began to, as part of the Black Consciousness Movement in Chicago, I didn't, I didn't realize it at the time, but Chicago was like a major hub of the Black Consciousness Movement. We had um, uh, Black artists on the south side of Chicago who were doing some phenomenal things. And many of those artists left Chicago to teach at Howard University. I discovered them only after I transferred mm. from Chicago to Howard in 1971. So uh, I was just beginning, as a teenager, I was just beginning to become aware of the contradictions in America. All men are created equal, but black people were considered human beings. Uh, black folk had to live on one side of town, white folk lived on another side of town. And there were numerous instances where I was jumped on by white guys for being in the wrong part of town. What do, what do you mean by jumped on? That, that's a 60s term, jumped on. Well, <laughs> um, somebody who wasn't around in the 60s. Well, I was, <laughs> my best friend and I went to visit my aunt in Chicago who had moved from from the west side where we lived, further west to an area known as K-Town. It was called mm -hmm. K-Town because all of the street names began with the K. And that was a largely Italian community. And so my friend and I uh, went to visit my aunt and it was about two miles west from where we lived. And we decided to, um, to walk, back, walk back home as opposed to you know waiting for the bus. And um, we walked past a a baseball field where a bunch of white guys were playing baseball. We walked past this mom and pop grocery store and some of the guys playing ball were talking to two cops 
And we walked past and I heard the cops say, what the what? And they all looked at us and we kept walking because we thought we were in good stead because the police were there. And we walked down the street and next thing I knew, there were about 12 guys chasing after us with sticks and bottles. Mm. Uh, and we ran, uh, they caught my friend. He broke away from them and, and ran and running down the street. I remember running to a barbershop, a white barbershop, banging on the door uh, asking the guy to help us. And he just waved me away. And we were saved by a black bus driver who happened to be driving down the street and saw what was going on. He stopped the bus in the middle, in the middle of the street and opened his doors. And we, my friend and I jumped in and, and, uh, you know, sat in the back of the bus and we watched these guys throwing bricks and bottles at the bus. And I remember saying to myself, you know, I hate white folk. And I only held with that feeling for about six months until we were going to a Boy Scout meeting on another part of town and we were jumped on by black guys for being, <laughs> <laughs> from, being from the wrong part of town. So that was life in Chicago, man. I learned how to run fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, did, did you get a track scholarship as a result of that? <laughs> Actually, I ran, I ran, um, I ran, um, cross country in college. Okay. All right. Okay. So I'm a marathon man. Oh, all right. So, so in Chicago, you're growing up in the nineties, you graduated in 19, 1969. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have, you talk about the divisions in sure. Chicago in terms of the residential patterns, the racial patterns, the struggle for, for, uh, freedom, economic rights uh, that would be going on with the various demonstrations. You experience the Panthers, you, you experience the doc, Dr. Martin Luther King. And, and you mentioned Hampton. I, I think I saw a news clip today where there's a fundraiser going on to turn his house into a, uh, a um, historical site. Sure. Do you know anything about that? Uh, yes, I do. I, I met, uh, met Fred Jr. Uh, a while ago and when they were actually raising money to save the house because it was uh they had fallen behind on their taxes and it was going to be auctioned off so there was a fundraiser to to save the house the house is actually in maywood illinois and maywood is a western suburb that's about uh, three suburbs away from 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 chicago so maywood would be the equivalent for those who live in the dmv maywood be would be the equivalent of rockville Okay. Uh, it was a small black um, black township, black community. And what I remember about Maywood growing up was that uh, my aunts, uh, who my mother's younger sisters, would go uh, roller skating at a skating rink in Maywood. And Monday was Negro night. That was the only <laughs> night that we black folk were allowed to, to, to go roller skating. So that was Chicago. Chicago was, when I was growing up, and still is today the most racially segregated city in the United States. Yeah, and unfortunately, that's reflected in some of the headlines in news today. Absolutely. So you, get, you, you still get these contradictions, so. Sure, uh, and, and you know, most people don't understand that. And so they, they think that, you know, black folk in Chicago are just killing themselves or, 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 or just uh, so uncivilized. But what I came to understand uh, much later after having left Chicago, um, I, I, I majored in, in architecture my freshman year in college at the University of Illinois, and I took two years of architectural cl classes my, uh, my last two years in high school. So I had aspirations of being an architect. And it wasn't until after I left Chicago that I came to understand uh, the public housing projects. And that was an experiment in social engineering mm. where they built these these high rises that were 13 to 15 stories. Uh, each high rise contained maybe uh, 1300 people. And there were four of these high rises per block and they stretched for at least a mile or more. So you have this concentration of impoverished people. And uh, because of how the social welfare system was set up, uh, the women who were receiving welfare could not have a man living in the house. They had to be single. 
Mm -hmm. And social workers would make these unannounced visits at three o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning. And if there was a man in the house, in the bed, they would be kicked out. If they found uh, a television or things in the household that they knew you couldn't afford, you would be booted out. But if a woman had additional children, she would get an increase in her welfare benefits. So the whole system was created in order to produce the, the dysfunction that we find in Chicago in large urban centers now. I didn't know it at the time, but having studied um, American history and, and the presence, ever presence of racism in the United States of America, I came to understand how these environments were created in order to produce the effects that we see now. Would, th would that be a major takeaway for a younger generation to understand is how these seemingly problems that are the fault of an individual are really has structural dimensions, if I'm not sure. using too too big of a term here for the Absolutely. audience. Every problem has a cause. And when you look at the source of the problems that African-Americans have been confronted with in this country, I would say 99% of those problems or the source of those problems can be attributed to racism. And racism manifests itself in myriad ways. Economic, it's social, it's educational. It impacts every aspect of life, which is one of the reasons why my, my dear colleague and, and friend uh, and ancestor now, Francis Cress Welsing, uh, mm -hmm. wrote about the nine areas of people activity where racism manifests itself. And all of those nine areas can be seen very clearly in Chicago and most urban centers. Mm -hmm. and, and just for the audience, what was Dr. Uh, Wesley's uh, most famous writing book? Dr. Welsing was, was famous. Uh, uh, for us, she was famous. For others, she was infamous for writing <laughs> <laughs> the ISIS papers, the keys to the colors, in which she as a psychiatrist uh, identified some of the reasons why racism was so prevalent in this country. Mm. Somebody's going to test our memory. They want to know, can we list the nine areas? I, I know I can't now, but uh, <laughs> we, we can take it up at another time. Okay. <laughs> but that would be a good test. I, I should know them off the tip of my tongue. But so for, for people growing up today, one of the thinking about the 60s, again, in terms of Chicago, is that you have these seemingly intractable problems that have some unique causes. And so would you say to the young people today, when they see a cause or when they see a problem, what should they do? Every problem has a cause and every problem has a solution. So in order to find a meaningful solution to the problem, you first have to understand its origins, who created it and how it manifests itself in your life. So with that understanding, you now can begin the process of attempting to solve the problem based on real facts and not just reacting to problems or reacting emotionally. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes sound understanding in order to, to undo um, profound systems and laws that have been created in order to ensure your continued demise. Right, uh, Amy wrote earlier when we were talking, when I used the term jumped or asked you to explain it, she said it was same in Harlem. So it was a, it was a common term in, in Harlem at the time as well. Absolutely. And and then Martha Peterson has chimed in this. Then the sixties were years of awakening and enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And there's the and we'll get to this. Uh, say it loud, and I'm I'm black and I'm proud. Absolutely. Umgawa, black power. Mm -hmm. Wakashima Umgawa. <laughs> yes. yes, sir. <laughs> yes, and so the 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 within this United States of contradictions. Um, you mentioned that the, the the first two of your M's are Malcolm and Muhammad Ali. Yes. Uh, who, who, who is Malcolm, first of all? Uh, Malcolm X, uh, they just recently, uh, we just recently celebrated the, I think the 54th anniversary of his assassination. He was assassinated on a Sunday, February 21st, uh, 1965 at the Autobahn Ballroom. In, in Harlem, New York. And I do remember sitting in my kitchen and my mom had the, the television on when the story broke about Malcolm. Now, I didn't know a lot about Malcolm as a young child. And I recall my mother 
uh, in about 1966, bought me a copy of the autobiography of Malcolm X. And mm -hmm. to my embarrassment, I set that book on a table and it stayed there for, for three years <laughs> before I picked it up and read it. I read it as a freshman in college and reading that book uh, transformed my life in so many, many ways. Uh, so I, I grew to appreciate Malcolm uh, only after he was gone. But living in Chicago, which was the home of the Nation of Islam, uh, we had a very close family friend who was a, a buyer for, for the nation. They had uh, numerous businesses on the uh, west side of Chicago where their headquarters was. And this friend, um, uh, I don't mind saying his name, uh, Calvin, Brother Calvin, Calvin X, was very close to uh, my parents and my aunts. And he gave me my first Quran. He showed me his um, uh, the store, the grocery store. It was called Your Grocery Store. And all of the items in Your Grocery Store were grown, canned, manufactured, produced, and transported from the Nation of Islam's uh, farms in the South um, to Chicago. So, And they all carried that label, Your Milk, Your Green Beans. And mm -hmm. I was impressed to see what Black people can do when they control their own environment. They had a wonderful restaurant, Salam restaurant, a high-end restaurant. Um, and, and so for, for me, <clears throat> living in Chicago, segregated Chicago, it was good for me to see what self-determining Black people could do, even in a racist environment. When given the opportunity to focus our attention on what's best for us, uh, we always rose to the top. Okay. Haru Sa just gave us the um, nine areas of uh, Dr. Wesley, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. So, Thank you, Haru Sa. I can always rely on you to come. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I don't think he, he probably didn't Google that. He probably, he, oh, no, I'm, no. I know he, he, the brother. Yeah, he, he knew <laughs> it. He, he knows it. He knows it. Uh, so, so one of the things you came away with in terms of a takeaway for the younger generations you just mentioned, and I'm just going to paraphrase it again, is that even within a, a repressive, regi repressive regime, a racist repressive regime, there is area for self-determination. Absolutely. You know, um, I've always said growing up in Chicago, I had black dentists, mm -hmm. I had black doctors, uh, I had a bad case of acne when I was uh, in high school. I went to uh, a black dermatologist. It was only later that I found out how significant this man was. His name was Dr. Theodore K. Lawless, and he had gained notoriety during the Second World War when he had come up with techniques for treating soldiers who had um, had been damaged by, by in war. So there were all of these brilliant people who uh, were working for black folk in the black community. We just didn't realize at the time how brilliant they were. Mm -hmm. uh, so I grew up seeing examples of excellence all around me. And it reminded me, despite the shortcomings within um, living in Chicago, it reminded me of, of, of the potential that I had within me. So there were no barriers that could keep me from achieving anything that I set my mind to. Yeah, we were talking about Malcolm X and Amy chimes in there's recent news reports. I haven't read them. I've seen the headlines about a new letter right. that, was, that was just released by the family yes. of um, one of the so-called bodyguards or security officers. Yeah, he, was, he was a New York police officer who, who was working undercover, and it was his job to arrest uh, Malcolm's bodyguards so that they would not be on duty uh, the afternoon that Malcolm was killed. So I, there's a there's a press conference online that you can see where he, um, his nephew, I believe, talks mm -hmm. about the letter. Okay, all right. So I, I, I've seen the headlines. I haven't, I haven't delved into it uh, mm -hmm. in, in very, very deeply, but it sounds intriguing because there've been a couple biographies that have attempted to reinterpret Malcolm's life. Uh, yes. One that has, both gotten praise and quite a bit of criticism was by Manning Marable on his 
Yeah, I that was a hatchet job. That, yeah, that that's was, that, well, that's that's what a lot of people have said. Mm -hmm. I, I I didn't read it. I started it, but then I stopped. I said I, when it first came out, I I I um. I said I, I didn't need to read that. And I was disappointed because of I'm a, I was a, I'm a big fan of Absolutely. Manny Barbo's work. I mean, I've, I've learned a lot, but I don't know why he wanted to go down that road. You know, what it is, if you, if you think about it, Manning was was ill um, maybe the last decade of his life. I believe he had lung cancer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, he never finished the book. So the book was finished by a colleague of his. And um, I don't know how much of that book they changed. Ah, okay. But, uh, it, it, it made some insinuations about Malcolm that were, you know, something that you would see on, on Fox News. It was just out of left field and had nothing to do with the man. So I think the publisher was just trying to sell some books. Mm, okay. But well, I don't think it had a long shelf life. So, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, unfortunately it's published and, there it is for whoever wants to, to do a kind of Fox News scandal type of analysis of the life of Malcolm X. But but I tell you, Jerome, uh, what it goes to show us or remind us is that they will even they will even assassinate you when you're dead. Mm, yes. If your personality is that powerful, um, you can't even you can't even rest in peace in a racist environment. Mm. So they'll do everything they can to to undermine his, his legacy, because if people really understood what Malcolm overcame and how he overcame difficulties, he went from being a hustler, a drug dealer, you know, a pimp, to become one of the most powerful leaders in America. Uh, and it speaks to the talent that was always within this man that he never had a chance to fully cultivate because of racism. But despite the shortcomings, he still he still is a phenomenal personality. And the other important thing about the letter, uh, this new letter just coming out, is that it reminds us of the story of Fred Hampton and the murder of Fred Hampton. People are talking about the the FBI informant who was responsible for Fred Hampton's murder. So we can now see that uh, it wasn't just the Black Panther Party. Practically every organization, every black organization mm -hmm. that was striving to change our circumstances in the United States was subjected to harassment right. uh, by uh, the federal government, the FBI, the, the, the police force. So these are issues uh, that we have been dealing with in the United States of contrad contradictions. We're still dealing with these uh, contradictions right now. Right. I. I, it's not just harassment. It went further that they actually destroyed many of these groups. Yes. And then in the in the destruction of the groups, it hollowed out the leadership in the community. Mm -hmm. And then when you hollow out the leadership and then you take out the leadership and then you bring in other and you bring in drugs and then you end up with a situation and you're trying to figure out, well, what's wrong with those people? Yeah. So, but it, and, and it also raises a question. Um, if the FBI, the government didn't kill black leaders. You have to really wonder who are they serving? <laughs> what purpose are they serving? And there's several who I won't name now who have a, a, a questionable reputation. Mm -hmm. uh, Haru Saw says that Marable's book was the first book he ever brought and threw away. <laughs> <laughs> a waste of 25 bucks, huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Oh, of course, across since we're talking about the 1960s project, many of the blogs and many of the conversations always take us back to the autobiography of Malcolm X, Absolutely. which suggests that maybe it's time to do a reread of, of it uh, in some kind of collective study group. Yesterday on in Washington, D.C., I guess it's online as well, but WPFW FM, they had a tribute to the life of uh, Malcolm X. So and much of the programming of that of the day was devoted to Malcolm X's life and accomplishments. I personally feel that the autobiography of Malcolm X should be mandatory reading for every black person. Should be okay. mandatory. Right. So that you have an understanding of what we have to deal with, uh, what we have always had to deal with. Mm. Things have changed. Right, right. Yeah, I would I would add to that in in, in an upcoming blog, um, which was a 
uh, about from a white female growing up in the middle of America. One of the most profound books she had was she read was the autobiography of Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was, and and it's uh, I, I'll just tell a quick anecdote here. You know when when uh, Baba Dick Gregory passed away, uh, Lawrence McDonald, uh, Mac, uh, Lawrence. Um, He's on W um, MSNBC. Um, he did a tribute to Dick Gregory. And I, you know, it was the only major outlet that did that, and I and I I just filed that in my head. <laughs> <laughs> and then he spoke at his his um, his ceremony, uh -huh. um, and he gets up talking about as a young white kid growing up in Boston, how hey. he fell in love with the works of. Dick Gregory and how they influenced his life. And one of the greatest moments was when he was walking down the street and he saw Dick Gregory. <laughs> and you know, Dick, you know, he, he speaks to everybody, right? Absolutely. <laughs> and so that was a highlight. And not only did he read the books, his mother read the books along with him. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that was. I, I, had, I had the pleasure, and I, you know, Dick lived in Chicago and had the pleasure of meeting, uh, seeing Dick for the first time at a uh, civil rights fundraiser that was held at uh, Roosevelt University Auditorium. So it was uh, Dick, uh, Dr. King, um, got all of, the, all of the, the major civil rights figures were there to raise funds for, for Dr. King. So it was very exciting uh, to live through those times and to be able to see how well the community came together we were clear at that time what the issues were and what we needed to do as a community in order to challenge some of those issues uh, is not as clear today because of, um, you know, we're so spread out, our communities are so diverse now. And, um, and, and you know, the other thing that uh, did us in uh, is, um, is integration. Mm -hmm. uh, when we were segregated, we had everything that we needed within, within our community. And uh, when that ended, then uh, the the community, the 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 harmony that existed within our communities was going, and that's probably one of the reasons why uh, King, when he was in Washington uh, at the White House with Abernathy and Lyndon Johnson was signing civil rights legislation, I think it was the Fair Housing Act. Uh, King said that we are integrating into a burning house. Right. Uh, and so the issue for those involved in the movement was never integration. It was just rights. Yes. They wanted civil rights mm -hmm. not to live with white folk. But but I, I think uh, knowing uh, how dirty the, the game of politics is, um, some politicians probably thought that integration would be a great way to destroy the infrastructure that had maintained the black community. Um, and that's, in fact, uh, what it has done relatively well. Well, whether it was intentional or not, that was the outcome. So. Well, I, I'm, I'm of the mindset that nothing happens by accident. I don't believe in accidents or, or coincidences. And knowing what I know now about the role that uh, the University of Chicago played in creating the social systems that are still impacting the lives of Black folk, I know that these were part of, of, of plans that a handful of folk set down in order to continue to disenfranchise the African-American community. Right. Okay, we have a couple comments. Uh, one says that they, that in fact, uh, Dr. Wesley had 10 principles and, and the 10th one was health. Well, actually the 10th one was added uh, by someone else. So that was, that was not within her original nine points. Okay, all right. Uh, and O'Kella reminds me, she's helping with my short-term memory. It was Lawrence McDonald on uh, w, uh, MSNBC, and he he uh, he says one of the most influ influential people in him growing up who helped shape him was Dick Gregory. Mm -hmm. so, and you know what I have to say, I, mean, I, I appreciate Dick, um, not so much as a comedian because he turned away from comedy in order to devote the rest of his life to the civil rights movement. And a comedian, uh, a DC comedian who I now who I now see following that path is uh, Dave Chappelle. Okay. Uh, the last couple of months, Dave has has said some pretty impactful things, and he's the closest comedian I know of 
who is following in the footsteps of Dick Gregory. Okay. Yeah, it was a news article about whether or not who was the poet or the comic who's picking up the mantle to be the critic as well. Mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, well, that's, we'll have to keep an eye on that in, pos in a positive way. Absolutely. Uh, so we, let's move on to the second M, Muhammad Ali. Hmm. Why is he, uh, he uh, an important M for you? Well, um, when I was a kid <clears throat> growing up, my father and I would always watch uh, Friday night at the fights. Right. Every Friday evening in Chicago, the fights would come on and he would get a pizza and we sit down <laughs> and watch the fight. So I grew up, uh, I'm not a big sp sports fan, uh, but I've always um, appreciated boxing. And so when Muhammad Ali came on the scene to just see him dominate all the fighters, plus uh, he was intelligent, he was articulate. Um, and he was a good looking man and, and didn't mind telling you how good looking he was. <laughs> um, and then he joined the Nation of Islam. And, uh, and, and so Muhammad Ali's decision not to join the army was, was important for us, was major for us, uh, particularly because uh, around that time, uh, you know, the Vietnam War was going strong and black men were around 25% uh, of the deaths in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So um, were it not for the fact that I was in college and I had a 2S classification, I would have been, I would have been drafted. I would have gone to Vietnam. So to see this man stand up and say no to the system inspired uh, a host of other men, some of my friends who weren't in college to say that they weren't going to uh, be drafted. So okay. I appreciated Muhammad Ali's nerve and courage, both inside and outside of the ring. And it, what's the message that you're going to pass? Would you, would you be passing on to a, a younger generation? What can they learn from studying the life of Muhammad Ali? Well, Muhammad Ali was the greatest, not because he said he was the greatest, but because he demonstrated it in every aspect of his life. Uh, he trained hard. He fought hard. He's the only heavyweight champion to win the championship belt three times. And um, he had a significant um, career. But he also spoke out against injustices. Many athletes, unfortunately, um, take the money, spend it on cars and women and make no contribution to their community. But Ali was one of, of several athletes who particularly during the late 60s, um, stood out against injustices and, and said that I can make it in this world as a um, highly respected athlete and personality, but I'm not going to abandon my community. Mm -hmm. So that was something that was very important to an impressionable young person such as myself. And so is the message is never to abandon your community? Don't sell out. You don't have to sell out in order to be successful. And, and um, um, Muhammad Ali demonstrated that throughout his life. Mm -hmm. Martha has posted a question, but I'm going to hold that question till we get further into our discussion, <laughs> because I think we'll be able to use that more as a wrap up than to, to address it right now. But Martha, hold on. We're, <laughs> we're going to come back and pick you up on that one, pick up on that one. So we've got Malcolm, we have Muhammad, then you have Martin. Now, who is Martin? Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And um, Dr. King <clears throat> came to Chicago. He, he decided to bring his struggle for civil rights up north. Right. And because of the fact Chicago was the most racially segregated city in the United States, he decided that he was going to integrate Marquette Park. Now, anyone who lived in Chicago knew that there were certain certain areas, certain communities that you as a black person did not go to. You didn't go to Cicero, Illinois, uh, which was another suburb to the west of Chicago. You didn't go to Market Park. You didn't go to the area near, uh, near the stockyards where uh, Mayor Daly lived. There were certain communities where if you went, uh, you would come out in a body bag. And that was just known knowledge. But Dr. King decided that he was going to rent a house in Market Park to uh, expose the redlining and the other um, illegal actions that were being taken to marginalize black folk. And um, as he was returning to his apartment with his entourage, 
there was a crowd, hundreds of, of, of angry white people gathered in front of his house. And as he stepped out of the car and walked toward his house, someone hit him in the head with a brick. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing that on the news. I remember seeing that image on the front page of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I recall Dr. King saying that he has faced all kinds of racists in Alabama, in, in Mississippi, and Georgia, but he had never faced the kind of vitriol and racism that he was confronted with in my hometown, Chicago. And that evening, Mayor Daley, who was the only mayor I knew when I lived in Chicago for uh, 21 years, uh, Mayor Daley met with Dr. King and told him, I can't protect you here. You need to find somewhere else to do your demonstration. And King closed down shop and then moved to um, one of the projects in Chicago in order to demonstrate uh, unfair housing there. And, um, you know, King did not have a very successful uh, tenure in Chicago. The mm -hmm. problems that he was trying to address were too much for him to overcome. And he wound up going back south because Chicago was a different animal. Mm -hmm. I, I remember those news uh, reels and television reporting on the viciousness of the crowds in Chicago when King was was there. Mm -hmm. That I think that was also the beginning when King began to recognize, and I shouldn't say beginning to recognize, because I think he knew all the time, but he began to become more vocal about what we now call the structural aspects of, exactly. of, exactly. of racism and how the system itself is produces that, mm -hmm. the kinds of outcomes that we, we, uh, we witness. Uh, so... So the message from King is, is not necessarily to turn around, is it? No, the message from King is to know your enemy and to be strategic in how you deal with your enemy. And the last year of Dr. King's life, he was a vocal uh, opponent to the Vietnam War. He gave his speech uh, a year to the day before he was assassinated at Riverside Church in New York City, why I opposed the war to Vietnam. So King got on point with, um, with Malcolm. He also got on point with Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. And as a result of making that speech on April the 4th, 1967, King lost, I would say 90% of his support. His support dried up. And I'll never forget, um, uh, guys, what was that Negro who wrote for the Washington Post? Um, uh, Carl, 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 what was Carl, his Rowan? Name? Carl, Carl Rowan. Rowan, Carl Rowan, Carl Rowan wrote an article uh, condemning Martin Luther King for that speech and said he should stick to civil rights and not uh, international issues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, and when Dr. King was was murdered and, and you know, because of, of this letter that has come out about uh, the police agent uh, informant who uh, was indirectly responsible for the assassination of, um, of uh, Malcolm X, uh, we now are beginning to see more stories coming out about the government's role in the assassination of Dr. King. Yeah. Dr. King's family uh, sued, went to court, uh, and, and, and proved that uh, James Earl Ray was not the person responsible for assassinating Dr. King. And all the evidence shows that it was an FBI uh, team that was sent in to assassinate uh, Dr. King. So, you know, the, the, the other takeaway is, despite the fact that his life was in constant danger, he did not give up on his people. Um, he knew that uh, his life was, was insignificant compared to the, the difficulties that we were confronted with as a people. So it, it illustrated to me a profound act of selflessness that is surely needed among our, our population today. Right now, everyone, well, not everyone, but too many people are only thinking about themselves. They're only thinking about uh, making money, getting paid, and, and, and don't want to get involved in the struggle. Well, that's not 
the spirit that is responsible for doors being open for you. Everyone who has a decent job, everyone who is able to, to live where they want to live is a beneficiary of all the sacrifices that were made in the 1960s. So we can't ever forget that. And as long as I'm alive, I'm going to continue to speak to that issue so that folks will, will understand that nothing happens by accident. We are where we are. Um, as a result of sacrifices that were made by people we may never understand. Well, we, we, never yeah, we, we were talking about the, the the racism that King faced and David Lang says it was no worse than in Boston when busing began. Yeah. And it's, well, yeah, many of the Northern cities, Absolutely. Philadelphia, Absolutely. Uh, you, Washington, you, DC. Washington, DC. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. You began to part of, part of the so-called white flight Hmm. A lot of different reasons for it, but one of the major reasons for the white flight was to get away from black people. Absolutely. And the, the, um, to, and since you were in architecture, you know how you redesign space in order to uh, socially control folks. Mm -hmm. and if, and if, I, if, if, the, if the 1950 zoning plan for the District of Columbia had been in fully in effect, 68% of the land mass would have been highways to help white folks hmm. get in and out of the city. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. But I'll tell you this too, Jerome. Um, I remember I remember when King was assassinated. Um, I was I was driving on the highway with my friends when we got the news that he was shot. And I said, if he dies, all hell is going to break loose. And sure enough, on the west side of town, all hell did break loose. And the, in, the entire business section in my community was burned to the ground and mm -hmm. had not been redeveloped. Uh, but it, what's interesting is that only the west side burned down, not the south side. And what I found out later was that one of the reasons why the south side didn't burn down was because the Blackstone Rangers, um, uh, the Blackstone Rangers went to the businesses in the black community and said, you know, you pay us X amount of money and I'll make sure that your establishment doesn't burn down. So, you know, that was another issue I didn't find out until much later. But when I moved to Washington to attend Howard in 1971, I was surprised at the poverty in Washington mm -hmm. and walking from um, the, the house that I lived in at 16th and S down Florida Avenue to Howard University. I walked past 14th and U, which in 1971 was ground zero for the heroin epidemic. Heroin was so bad in D.C. that the stoplights on the corner of 14th and U had speakers on them that when the lights turned red, they would say, stop, stop, stop. So the junkies wouldn't walk into the street and get hit by cars. Mm -hmm. And and I was so surprised, Jerome, to be in the nation's capital and to see all the burnt out buildings from 1968 that had not been renovated. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe I was in the nation's capital. Right. So um, and, and now <laughs> I can't believe I'm in the nation's <laughs> capital <laughs> driving down 14th Street because uh, it's no longer Chocolate City. It's uh, you know, it's, it's Vanilla City with the little chocolate sprinkles on the perimeter. Right. Well, let me go back to a comment that Ron made, Ron Cole, when we're talking about athletes. And he said one of Ali's greatest uh, feats was he able to he was able to transcend the sport to become the world's spokesman for Absolutely. human rights or a spokesman on human rights. So Absolutely. OK, so we have Malcolm. We have Muhammad. We have Martin. Now we got Motown. Where's that fit in? <laughs> well, um, you, Jerome, you came of age in the 60s, so you know how important music was in our lives. And nobody did it better than The Temptations. Uh -huh. Nobody was smoother than Smokey Robinson and The Miracles. Yes. So we had, you know, we had Marvin and Tammy. We had The Supremes. We had Mary Wells. We had The Marvelettes. We had all this incredible music. Now, Chicago, you know, wasn't, wasn't, um, um, was it wasn't lacking? We had Curtis Mayfield. We we had uh, we had the Shy Lights. We had um, the the Five Stair Steps. We even had the Jackson Five for for a little while. So Chicago was 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 the home of the blues. But we we did our thing pretty well with R and B. So music was a part of our lives, man. And and as far as I'm concerned, Motown was the soundtrack of the um, of the '60s. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that music was real music with uh, real lyrics that you can still sing today. Mm -hmm. uh, real musicians, uh, you can still feel the, 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 the rhythm. You can, you can still feel the soul. And that's an 
integral thing that is missing from today. Uh, back during the 60s, we call each other soul brother and soul sister. Uh, we ate soul food. We listened to soul music. And, and that is what's missing now. Uh, many of these young folk who've grown up with these digital devices uh, and, and can't look you in the eye when they talk to you are listening to what I refer to today as crap music because every other word is profanity and there's no spirit in it. There's no soul in it. Uh, and that's one of the things that I, that I wish I could, I could take from the 60s and, 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 and drop in every major urban center of the United States right now so that folk can feel what we felt. Mm -hmm. uh, there was power, there was an energy, there was a consciousness that is just lacking right now. And I think that that contributes to some of the, the, the difficulties that many of our young people are confronted with now because they aren't grounded in that thing that they really sustained us as, uh, as young people growing up. Well, I was fortunate enough to see before pre-pandemic pre to see on Broadway the show on the Temptations, Ain't Too Proud to Beg. I and saw it too, brother. It was, <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> and the thing that, that it was like an old people sing along. Everybody <laughs> knew, knew the, the uh, knew, knew the uh, knew the lyrics to all the songs and everybody mm -hmm. just, so, and it tried to, it captured. Um, it sure did. Uh, the time. And also I, I was not, didn't really know the story of the Temptations. And this is why you have these biographies and musicals to uh, the founder of the Temptations. And again, my short-term memory is going to fail me. Otis Williams. Otis, Otis Williams. Williams. Otis yes. Williams. How he wanted to build a concept as opposed to individual performers and how that the, the, the notion, the business, the concept of the temptation still lives today. Exactly. So, yeah. and, and speaking of music. And he's the only original temptation left. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. And you know, the, when we think about the temptations, I mean, David Ruffin was one of the baddest singers around. Eddie Kendricks sang tenor. I mean, Eddie Kendricks sang like an angel. So, so these guys inspired me to no end uh, and help to cultivate uh, profound uh, love for music and more specifically um, for, for the lyrics. Uh, to be honest, if I can, since, since you know, I'm testifying today, I actually, um, when I transferred from, from the University of Illinois to Howard, I changed my major from architecture to design and I was going to minor in music. Uh, I wanted to become a writer. Uh, I wanted to write lyrics like Smokey Robinson. I, I just fell in love with Smokey and how he was able to just capture the essence of, of love, man, the absence, essence of, of, of just, you know, communication um, in his lyrics, man. And so to me, he's still, he's still the best. Uh, Curtis Mayfield uh, wasn't a chump. Curtis Mayfield was one of the most dynamic writers out there, but Smokey is still my number one. Okay, this is, this is much, much later. But I had this dream that I could write a song so Jennifer Hudson could sing it. <laughs> no. I, I've, never, I've never written a song in my I wouldn't even know where to begin. But you may be inspired, man. Please. <laughs> well, some well, you, now, now, you, you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't go into songwriting. You went into another area, which we should talk about. Uh, let me just pick up a couple more comments here. Um, the uh, Baba Derek Jackson says at the Apollo, we had the battle of the groups. And Motown couldn't touch the moments, the Delphonics, the persuaders, the unification. Yeah, uh, well, look, look, the Temptations set the bar for all male groups. Now, granted, uh, after David left, oh. you know, eh, I never was a big fan of Dennis, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, but they set the bar. And of course, with each new group, you're going to improve on whatever the standard was. And, and that's that's entertainment. That's that's the way it is with anything. If you aren't improving, then then what's the point? Yeah, he, I said unification. I, I should have said the unifics. The so unifics. Uh, they were from D.C., if I'm not mistaken. Right. The beginning of my end. Oh, yeah, right. was, you, you know, you're losing me now. <laughs> yeah, that, that was one of, one of my biggest hits. You, you've reached my limits of my <laughs> popular culture awareness. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I dug the Delphonics. La la means I love you. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I, I, that that song just moved me to no end. And Thomas Bell and Linda Creed were the 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 team 
um, the songwriting and arranging team behind that. So I've always appreciated uh, good writers uh, and good musicians. Uh, and so, you know, <clears throat> I moved away from, from architecture, but I still like the, the, the structure of building anything, whether it's the structure of a good song, the structure of a good story, uh, the structure of, of history, uh, everything has to have a framework uh, and has to be designed in such a fashion that it suits the purposes for which it was created. So it's all part of, it's all art, man. It's all art. And I'm a profound lover in a, uh, of art. Well, we, we've only touched the surface of the 1960s and I would encourage people to read your blog, but let's, let's shift to uh, some of the work you're doing now. Um, and how would you describe it? Well, um, <clears throat> That, you know, I wear many hats and that's a blessing and a curse. Um, I'm a writer, I'm a designer, I, uh, a researcher, I, I've written uh, seven books, I've co-authored seven books. I've been doing study tours to Egypt since 1987. For the past 12 and a half years, I've been uh, coordinating an archeological excavation in Egypt. Uh, I do a lot of things, and, and 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 I can say I do that because that's the artist in me. And all of these things that I do, I do from an artistic standpoint. I'm inspired, and I uh, find a way, a creative way of of manifesting that which inspires me. And and so everything that I've I'm, I'm, I've done in my life and in my career is a an extension of my work as an artist. I see myself as an artist first. And um, from that position, I branched out and done other things. Well, tell us about your work in Egypt. Well, um, <clears throat> I have for the past 12 and a half years been um, running the ASA Restoration Project, which is an archeological excavation uh, restoration project on the West Bank of Luxor, Egypt. We are the first people of African ancestry in the history of Egyptian archeology span to fund and fully participate in an archeological excavation. We are on the West Bank of Luxor in an area between the Valley of the Kings and Valley of the Queens. We are excavating and restoring what was initially three 25th dynasty tombs, three Kushite tombs, um, and up until 2019, um, let me stop you there. How, how old are these tombs? These tombs are 2,700 years old. So the 25th dynasty, there were 30 dynasties in the history of Egypt, the 3,000 year old history of Egypt. The 25th dynasty was the period in Egyptian history where she had fallen on hard times and um, Africans from, from Kush, which is now Sudan, came in, rulers came in and conquered Kemet, which is the original name for Egypt. They conquered Kemet and using their own words, they conquered the land of their ancestors to drive out the foreigners and to restore unity, which is what the 25th dynasty did. So they represent the first documented Renaissance in recorded history. They ruled Egypt for about a um, hundred years. And, uh, and so the tombs, the three tombs that we're excavating uh, are the tombs of three of the first Kushite noblemen who lived, worked in Egypt. Luxor, Egypt is 80% uh, of the monuments and temples in Egypt are in Luxor. And Luxor was the capital, the political, the spiritual, um, and the economic capital of Egypt for uh, about 2000 years. So these Africans from Sudan, were responsible for reorganizing and running the capital of the most powerful nation on the planet. That's awesome, Tony. Uh, how about your other uh, uh, site that you're working with? Tell us about that. Well, um, you know, one of the one of the beautiful things that happened uh, just this past season was we found four new tombs. So we now have eight tombs at our site that we're working on. And this past season, 
uh, we made a phenomenal discovery in that we found a pyramidion. A pyramidion is the capstone of a pyramid that stood over uh, one of the uh, tombs that we're currently excavating. So uh, we've made history every year uh, we dig in Egypt, we make history. And you know, I'm, I'm so proud to be doing this work. I, I really feel at this point in my life that this was the work that I was born to. I, I've heard you refer to them as the Negro dynasty. Well, European Egyptologists refer to the, the Kushite dynasty, the 25th dynasty as the Negro dynasty, which implies that the other dynasties in Egypt were not black. And that's a lie. Uh, that's one of the other things that I have spent the last 40 years of my life uh, challenging. I have to say I, I was blessed to have uh, to have as my, my jegna, my, my teachers, some of the most brilliant um, scholars and historians who've ever walked this planet. Uh, John Henry Clark, uh, John G. Jackson, uh, Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinen, Asa Hilliard, uh, Naeem Akbar, Wade Nobles, Ivan Van Sertima, Francis Crest Welsing. So I was privileged to, to have a working relationship with all, all of these scholars. And now many of them are ancestors and I'm now the elder. <laughs> I'm now the elder <laughs> statesman who is um, continuing this work. And then also following in their footsteps, opening the door for the generation who's coming behind me, my daughter and some of my other colleagues who've been working with me with, uh, with my business here in DC, IKG. Well, let me let me put in a plug for my sister, Okella. She's on here. She asked me to mention Drusilla Dungy. Dungy Houston, absolutely. What What do you know about her? Uh, she wrote a book in the 1930s, the the uh, wonderful Ethiopians of the ancient ancient Kushite Empire. She uh, lived in Oklahoma, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, and that was a two volume book. It was a classic. It was a classic that um, referenced Ethiopians. Kushites and the Kemites. So these are, this is, this is, this is the greatest civilization that the world has ever produced. It's a Nile Valley civilization, which happened to have been created by indigenous African people and Europeans in order to continue to, to um, write us out of history, have claimed Egypt as their own creation. Uh, Egypt, supposedly, if you listen to them, Egypt is no longer in Africa. Egypt is somewhere in the Middle East, wherever that is. And I have to say that this idea of Egypt being a, a European creation was, was really that idea uh, gained steam as a result of the work of James Henry Breasted from the University of Chicago, who, uh, through the work of the Oriental Institute, was responsible for... Um, stymieing uh, references to the ancient Egyptians as being um, black. And so this idea of the 25th dynasty being the Negro dynasty is something that I'm going to spend uh, the rest of my life uh, destroying. And we have found, we have found physical evidence over the past um, 14 years now that this site has been active to, um, to squash all of those myths, all of those lies. And so we'll be producing books and uh, we hope to be able to open these tombs uh, by 2025 so that people can travel to Egypt and see what we have done, what the African-American community has done to reclaim our history and culture. Right, I'm gonna put in a little plug since my sister is a, our family ge genealogist. She thinks there's a link between the Priscilla, uh, Drusilla Dungey and, and the pages, and oh, also really? and also between the Dungeys and Paul Coates. Well, a actually, yeah, because Paul has shared with me that uh, he found a, a um, genealogical connection with his sister. And you know, Paul was was born and raised in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, there yeah. may be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, well, let's let's see if we can circle back to what lessons would you like to leave for the younger generations as a as a wrap up. And I'm gonna have to apologize to Martha. I didn't get to her question, but we'll have to we'll have to do that on another show. Okay. Well, so one of the most important lessons that anyone can learn, young or old, is to remember your ancestors. Acknowledge your ancestors. Pour libation to them. 
And this is important because your ancestors live in you. And, uh, and, and I know, Jerome, you know this because of the work of your daughter, Gina. We carry within our body the genes of all of our ancestors, which means that those ancestors live in us. And because of my work with Dr. Welsing, uh, Dr. Richard King, who was a psychiatrist as well, Dr. Patricia Newton, who was a psychiatrist, they're all three ancestors now. Because of my work with them and the work that they were doing in uh, with the Melanin Conferences, um, they share with me that um, not only do we carry the genes of our ancestors, but we carry their memories. And Dr. Patricia Newton, who just left us uh, this past September, she identified being on staff at Johns Hopkins U University. Uh, she shared with me that Johns Hopkins, scientists at Johns Hopkins have identified the region in the body and the organ in the brain where your ancestor memories reside. So for us as African people to be able to tap into those ancestral memories is our saving grace. That is the reason why we have survived. That is the reason, well, you know, when you consider what we've been subjected to, no people on the planet have been subjected to the brutality that we have been subjected to, but we're still here. We're here in great numbers and we have our, our minds intact and we're doing phenomenal things. That is because of the genes that we carry in us and those among our, our community, among our family who have risen to the top have done so, I submit to you, Jerome, because they were able to tap into those ancestral memories and they become the geniuses, the genius of Muhammad Ali, the genius of Malcolm X, the genius of Martin Luther King, the genius of Stevie Wonder. And when we think about the essence of that word, genius comes from the word genes. So they are literally tapping into the ancestral memory that they carry with them and they pass on to their children. So one of the things that I would encourage young people to do is never disconnect yourself from your past. Never disconnect yourself from the from your ancestors. And this idea of rugged individualism is pure BS. Nobody mm -hmm. makes it by themselves. We are here mm -hmm. because we're standing on the shoulders of those who open doors for us, who burst down the doors, kicked in the doors and held them open so that we could crawl over their backs and, and continue our great march to freedom. So we have an obligation and a responsibility to remember all of these souls and to continue following in their footsteps and keep the doors open for the generations who are coming behind us. Well, 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 well you know, as we get started and, you know, Tony, you know him to go on. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> one night, what did you go for seven hours? <laughs> I, my mama said, I never met a mic I didn't like, you know. <laughs> I, I pumped out after four, and I knew some people who hung in you for the whole seven hours. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hey, we're we supposed to have this hour show. <laughs> well, we started <laughs> late now, so I'm not going to let you deprive me of my You didn't time. start six hours late. <laughs> you didn't start six hours late. <laughs> But it, it was it was great, and everybody who hung in there for the seven hours enjoyed it. But we we'll have to want to thank you for for joining us, and thank you for everybody for their comments. And we look forward to we here every Tuesday night uh, from five, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on on the 1960s project. Tony has a blog, and you can go to the website and read the blog. And it, this will also be posted on YouTube later. So Tony. Uh, thank you very much for bringing these wonderful voices from the 1960s. Jerome, thank you for giving me the opportunity and allowing others to share their knowledge with uh, with everyone else. I appreciate you, my brother. Thank you. You're welcome.